Hi, I'm Miriam, and welcome to the first chapter of Game Design Grimoire. One aspect I find particularly interesting is how we interact with games as a medium. There are lots of games that show interesting takes on user interfaces, short UI. Some of them, however, go to exceptional lengths to make them more than just screens over screens of menus. There is certainly a lot to be discussed about this topic, which is why this video will actually be the first in a little series, and will center on narrative-driven audio-visual UI design. So, if that piques your interest, look forward to a sequel. But without further ado, let's jump right in. First off, there's a comprehensive model to categorize different dimensions of UI, which I would like to present to you, and which you might have even come across if you're really into UI design. It seems to have been coined in a 2009 master thesis by two Swedish students, which is linked below for anyone interested. It makes use of a bifactorial matrix, meaning that it uses the two factors, part of the game's world and part of the game's story, and then asks whether they are true or false. This leaves us with four categories. First, non-diegetic. This refers to a classical 2D plane, for example, a simple start menu screen or the heads-up display. Similarly, health bars, ammo counts, icons, and many other essential UI elements that I'm sure you all know are part of this first category. Second, spatial. We understand spatial UI as elements that are part of the game's world, but which the player character is unaware of. Think, for example, of dotted lines guiding you to the next objective or collection spheres. Third, meta. Meta UI describes elements that are part of the narrative, but not part of the world. The most obvious and commonly used example of which might be blood spatters appearing when at low health. Furthermore, the infamous raindrops on the camera lens and even ink or mud that cover the screen are also part of meta UI. Fourth, diegetic. Last but not least, some games use elements that are part of both the game world and the narrative, like a map that is an actual in-game map, or health represented by liquid in a tube. As we will see shortly, most of the time games don't restrict themselves to only one of those categories, but combine them in various ways. Now, to analyze the topic at hand, we will begin our journey in hell, more specifically in the House of Hades and the roguelike dungeon crawler Hades, by American developer Supergiant Games, which came out of early access a few months back in 2020. Few tales are told of Hades, whose very name inspires fear and penitence, reminding us of the inevitable fate which we all share. I, however, mean to tell you such a tale. Listen carefully. Playing as Zagreus, the son of the Lord of the Underworld, who strives to escape the scorching heat of the Chthonic Realm, you will end up coming back to your home more often than you'd like. Namely, each time you die and are washed ashore by the underground river of Styx. In roguelikes, especially those who lean more towards continuous meta progress, and are thus often titled rogue flights, you want to keep track of things you've unlocked so far, achievements, collectibles, and of course, your upgrades. Now, the way Hades does this is incredibly nifty. The house itself functions as a hub area, and before you begin a new escape attempt, you will find that there are quite a few things to do. A cast of characters, some of which are definitely more gregarious than others, awaits to comment on your ordeal and to have conversations with, as does your ever so loyal friend Cerberus. Now, before you rush out the doors to Tartarus, however, that's when things get interesting. Zagreus will find permanent upgrades in the Mirror of Night, a huge mirror bestowed upon you by Nyx, the goddess of night, who supports you in your endeavor of escaping hell. Moreover, because of the meticulously crafted reactive narrative system, Nyx will from time to time comment on your progress, telling you that you managed to absorb the darkness into you, which also happens to be the name given to the currency used for these upgrades. And that is what makes the mechanic perfectly integrated in gameplay as well as the narrative. Another such case is the fated list of minor prophecies, essentially a list of missions for you to complete during your runs to reap rewards conducive to your undertaking. However, unlike in many other games, the list is not simply unlocked to be accessed through a mere menu, but rather through an actual scroll which you have to buy from the house renovating shades and which is then placed on your desk. 
I saw you took possession of the list of minor prophecies of the Three Fates. As ever, I should never have doubted my daughter's expectations. I was uncertain you had necessary guidance to select it from among the house contractors' many opportunities. The name, which refers to the 14 weaving fates in Greek mythology, destined to foretell the future, makes perfect sense and lends itself to a fun twist within the gameplay each time you fulfill one of those prophecies. I know better than anyone never to tamper with the fate's design. Though, if they had cruelty in store for you through their list, I think that I would warn you anyway. Other examples include a small fountain revealing the number of runs and enemies slain, through its water which is said to possess the power to glance into the past. Or, if we went out of Zachary's room, a cabinet of keepsakes you can equip for additional benefits each run. Or even the fact that the glossary in this game is an actual codex filled with descriptions about everyone, written by your mate Achilles. The pattern that reveals itself here is that the interaction with most of these UI elements starts off as diegetic, through objects placed in the game world, which only afterwards turn into meta-elements. This allows for a smooth transition between world design and gameplay mechanics, which most players, unless trying to figure out how to write a video essay discussing this topic, will probably not think about consciously. While the list of such examples goes on throughout the underworld, Hades is but one of many that excel at amalgamating gameplay and world-building aspects through its UI design. Another example of which is Hollow Knight by Team Cherry. The game's map, which is very much an essential part of the experience, is given to you by Cornifer, an actual cartographer who travels the earthy lands of Hollow Nest and shares with you his latest discoveries in form of a sketch of the respective area. To obtain a proper representation of the environment, however, you need to get a quill to draw in the details on your own. You even have the option to purchase markers, which can be placed on spots that caught your interest, making every player's map a unique piece and your journey a very personal one. Furthermore, similar to the Codex of Achilles in Hades, Information about enemies you encounter throughout the game are collected in the so-called Hunter's Journal, handed to you by an elusive character who goes by the name, yes you might have guessed it, the Hunter. Both games work with the logic of the player's understanding of the written text, growing with time and with more encounters, which justifies the fact that you have to beat enemies a certain number of times before the entry is revealed in its complete form. While these elements fall exclusively into the meta category, they are designed in a manner so intertwined with the storytelling aspect and represented logically as objects that would exist in the game world, that they equally support the game at drawing you into its universe and give you the opportunity to immerse yourself. Consequently, whenever I had a look on the map of Hollow Nest, I didn't only look at the game's map, but at my map, the one I fought for and desperately searched for the nearest bench to scribble in the details. In other words, this kind of UI design allows the player to think in terms of the game world instead of our world, making you forget that you're actually a human playing a game and not a tiny bug knight. Before we wrap things up for this chapter, you might remember me promising to talk about audiovisual UI design in the beginning, and we have only really covered the visual aspect of things thus far, which is why now we will talk about Sekiro Shadows Die Twice by From Software. Sekiro doesn't make use of many diegetic UI components, even though the sculptor and Emma are meant to incorporate upgrades more organically. What struck me the first time I played Sekiro and navigated the menus, however, wasn't the visuals alone. It was this sound. And this one. That is a stroke of genius there. What we're hearing, for each single click and navigation, are Japanese drums probably taiko drums, which nowadays are mostly known for spectacular festival performances, but back in feudal times predominantly served as a means of communication in the military context. And as a little cherry on top, the developers even went so far as to include sounds eliciting the image of an ink brush sweeping over paper when flipping pages. <laughs> Go 
Going to such a great length and considering these fairly subtle details might be something overlooked by many players. Nevertheless, it reinforces the 16th century Sengoku era atmosphere incredibly well, even on a subconscious level. And this, in combination with the wood and parchment stylization, as well as the inkbrush illustrations, which, although admittedly unrealistic, still give your new phone skills a fitting form, ties neatly into the world that Sekiro strives to portray. So, there you have it. It surely depends on the type of game for how much room there is to blend your eye design with mechanics and narrative, all while maintaining menu efficiency and at the same time creating a UI pleasant to use for the player. Nonetheless, titles like Hades, Hollow Knight and Sekiro show time and time again that there is a broad variety of little tweaks which developers can use to enhance immersion through their user interface, even when mainly using non-diegetic and meta elements. Do you have other examples that you really appreciate in this regard, or which maybe even put you off because they broke the immersion you had built up? Let me know in the comments below and look forward to the second part. If this was interesting to you, leave a like and if you don't want to miss any new content, consider subscribing. Thanks for watching and see you in the next chapter.